Hi, I'm Dr. Tim Weir, and I gotta tell you, I love life. But when I'm not being a husband, a father, grandfather, an author, or a practicing chiropractor, I'm the host of the television show, Loving Life with Dr. Tim Weir. I love to cook. I love to travel. I like to spend time with people who do what they love and love what they do. Join me and Elvis for the next 30 minutes as we help you discover how to love life. I'm with actor Tank Jones. You know, I say actor Tank Jones, but you're Tank Jones who happens to be someone who acts. Someone who acts. Because there's more to Tank Jones than just an actor. Some I think. Pick yeah. my hand, man. I'm glad you're here with Pleasure me today. Pleasure to meet you, sir. So uh, talk to me a little bit about, uh, because I got all this stuff here. This is all the things that you, I'm sure it's not all the things that you've done, all the movies. Oh, that IMDB thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're currently, you just get out of Union Bound. Yes. Yeah. First time in the Carolinas. Really? Yeah, that was my first time in the Carolinas. I, that project opened up my eyes in a lot of different ways. And there's another project on there that I'll be coming back to shoot in Wilmington that I learned about when I was here in North Carolina last time. So this all started not 10 years ago, not 15 years. So when did it start for you? So I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. Okay. I did my first commercial when I was two years old, believe it or not. Wow. I did a Sesame Street commercial uh, out in Chicago, Illinois. And my mom, she got, after I did this commercial, I had an agent and everything. And she got a serious bout of scoliosis. She had to have surgery. Oh, she was man. in a body cast for a year. You could have helped. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But she was in a body cast for a year. We lived I called in her and said, you know, See, I think I, know, I, I knew, I knew yeah. Dr. Weir sound familiar. Yeah. Said, no, that's not your dad, <laughs> but he might have been your doctor. Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, I, um, but we live 50 miles south of Chicago and okay. no one else taking me to my auditions career over. But I did all the church plays, I did all the school plays. It's just something that I just enjoyed doing. I played right. Jesus, I don't know how many church plays, and I was King Midas, I played uh, Ebenezer Screws in A Christmas Carol. I just enjoyed acting. And I moved out to Calif California, I'm sorry, I moved out to Arizona to be close to California. Mm. And I lived with my dad, I figured I might as well, I'm there, I'll get my degree, so I graduated from Arizona State University uh, with a degree in marketing. And after I finished, I just picked up the acting career and things have been, things have been going well. I took my foot off the gas a little bit on the acting side because people, they see my resume. So how come more people don't know you or haven't seen this? I actually took a long hiatus because when you think you're talented at a lot of different things, you think you can do everything. Mm -hmm. So I was running a couple of companies, I ran a couple of record labels, but realized I did all of those things well, but I love acting. I, there's nothing like being in front of a camera, even behind the camera, or just creating, taking a character that, some sheets, some paper, some lines, giving it life, giving it flesh, adding some accessories to it, and just bringing it to life. Nothing like. It, it. And not only does it give the life to the people, it gives you. It, it, it's what gives you life. Absolutely. I, we were shooting. Say when I was out here last, we we, we were shooting Union Bound. Like I said, never been to the Carolinas before. You guys got some bugs. They reminded yeah. me of home, and, but I hadn't been home in a long time. Yeah. So mosquitoes, ticks, chiggers, everything. It was hot, it was humid. We were in wool clothing. I loved it, every part of it. We were shooting sometimes 12, 14, 16 hour days and we even had some people pass out on set because it's good, it, isn't was, it? it was <laughs> dehydration. <laughs> I wasn't one of them uh, because I mean, I just get so enthralled in the process and it doesn't matter. I'm at that point in my career. I just like being on set. I mm -hmm. just enjoy creating and I can go and go and go until it's cut and it's time to go home. So for example, the character that you played in Union Bound, mm -hmm. how did you get into that character? How did that come about? Okay, good question. So for those of you who don't know, Union Bound, we shot it out here in the Carolinas. It's the story of a Union soldier gets captured by the Confederacy ships up to a stockade in the Carolinas, mm -hmm. escapes and somehow stumbles upon a plantation that I, Jim Young, slave at, happens to, happens to be at, and I try to help them escape to freedom. Obviously, I've never been a slave before. Thank God, we live in the 2000s and I'm free. But 
Ste um, if you watch the film, Jim's struggle is a, one of a human struggle. And he's struggling to do the right thing. He's struggling to follow his conscience, right. follow his... Basically, in, even in the extremes of extenuating circumstances that he was pushed into, doing the right thing above all. And humanity prevails in the story. Mm. Well, I latched on, if you will, to the human humanistic part of, J of Jim. Sure. I didn't have to be a slave to sure. be human. And his story is a tale of human, which is why I like that film and I want people mm. to see it, because it tells, in my opinion, up at least until now, uh, slaves aren't just caricatures. They, they have life in this film. Right. So I've had my own personal struggles and freedom can mean many different things, not just necessarily being in chains, bondage that you can exactly. see. You can be in mental bondage, you can be in anguish that no one knows about. And like I told you, I was not doing what I was loving to do. Yes, I was running some companies having some success, but this is what I do. Mm. And I wanted to pour everything in, that I could into that character right. so that one, I could get it out because I needed to, but hopefully when people would watch it, that they would also feel what I felt. And good work begets more work. And I wanted to give the very best performance I could give to the producer, to the director, to the other actors. And so I, I watched uh, mini series, I watched documentaries, I listened to recordings, I read books, wow. everything that I could. I have this 12 step process, yes, 12 steps. <laughs> that I go through to create okay. a We can talk about that. I know, I know. I, 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 but I don't have a problem. The first step is to admit it. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I um, to make the character breathe. And I have plenty of script notes and just going back and forth, back and forth and acting it out. Okay, that worked, that didn't work. And just, I knew the whole script, right. actually, not just my lines. Wow. I knew everybody else's lines too. And that's my process. And, make it, I do it so much because uh, step number 12 is let it all go. The only way you can do that is if you do your homework. So I do as much homework as I can so I can step on the stage and then all I'm doing is reacting, acting and reacting to the other actors. Well, it, it ought to be so much so that people think you are a slave. Pretty much. And that's the, that's the key to acting. Yeah. The key to acting is not to act. The key yeah. in acting is to be. To be it. And the best compliment that I got after this film was done, I had several of my friends and family tell me, you know, this is one of the first times that when I looked up on the screen and I saw that character, I didn't see you. Wow. I just saw the character. That's amazing. And that's that, for people who are super, super critical, especially of me, um, to have them say that was a big plus for me. And just let me know I'm, I'm right at home. This wow. is what I love to do. Love your work. Thank you. Love very what much, you do. Uh, and say, as I said, now I'm out here shooting a horror film. It's my first horror film. It's about I'm, mother in laws. Yeah, it's about <laughs> what all of us <laughs> want to do something about. <laughs> I'm not even going there right now because I want mother in laws sending me your letters. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, my character's name is Kevin, and he's the boyfriend. He's kind of like the heart, if you will, through the gore and the kill wow. fest throughout this. Maybe he makes it, maybe he doesn't, but I started a hashtag online called hashtag don't kill Kevin. So if you go to hashtag don't kill Kevin online, you'll see all the different things that have been popping up since I've been shooting the film. It's been great. Uh, gentleman Hal Burdick, he sh uh, he's the producer and director of this. Great cast. One of the girls that I work, actually two people that I work with from Union Bounder in the film. Oh, too. really? Yeah. So How cool. I was, it was really nice to work yeah. with them in a different way. And then the other one that I was telling you about, a reckoning. So the thing that happened in Wilmington, 1898, I don't know if you know what happened in Wilmington circa 1898, no. uh, but it was the first quote unquote coup d'etat in United States history. I think it's the one and only where the city, where the townspeople overthrew the city government. Wow. And it was a very integrated city. And there's, there's, stories on both sides to say what happened, what sure. really happened. But there's a gentleman, his name is Alan Weiss. He wrote this script, he's from Wilmington, wrote this script called A Reckoning. And we're gonna be shooting that later on this year in Wilmington. How so cool is that, man? I've been in North Carolina so much. Yeah. I love you guys. You might as well just get a driver's license Yeah, here pretty much. I'm, I'm, if, if you guys legally allow me to do that and still keep mine, I'm, I'm all, all right. for it. We'll talk to the go governor. Can you do something about this? Help a brother out. <laughs> <laughs> 
Awesome to be with you, man. Thank you so much, Doc. It Keep was a loving pleasure. life, man. I do. The, I do my very best. Yeah. You do the same. This is fun. I'm going to. You see this lush lavishness out here? I said this is a. You guys, if you don't, if you haven't come out here, you need to make sure you do. This is a man right here. Don't change the channel. We'll be right back. Just because you're in an accident but didn't ride in one of these doesn't mean that you didn't get injured. Hello, I'm Dr. Tim Weir. And after 35 years in practice, I can tell you a lot of times an injury doesn't show up for two to three days after an accident. So if you've been in an accident, don't delay any further. Call my office today. Raleigh Spine and Injury Chiropractic. Just when you thought nobody cared. Call 790-1332 right now. Hey, you know how I always say I love people who create and I love people who own their own businesses because they, they know exactly uh, how life really is. And I'm with Gil at Aquatic Creations Group. Gil? Pleasure to meet you, Tim. We've known each other for what? Five, what? six, seven years, something like at that? At least, yeah. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about your history of how you got involved in, in all of this. Okay. Well, it goes back a long ways. Uh, I'm originally from California. Um, I was born and raised in the Central Valley on a dairy farm. Really? Decided really early on in life that I was not interested in taking over the dairy farm. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Yeah. But I was obsessed with fish and fishing. Ended up going to college, put my way through college. I ended up with a master's degree, went to school at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories. And my time spent at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories were three or four of the best years of my life. Wow. Um, just a lot of adventures. And uh, as I finished up there, I was able to get on as a diver and a collector at the Monterey Bay Aquarium in California. Right. And so that was a dream come true. So I worked there about 18 years on all kinds of different things. Uh, sh everything from sharks to deep sea animals to the local flora and fauna of Monterey and learned a lot. I worked with some of the best people in the world in that industry. Um, By the way, that is one of the most, I believe it is probably one of the top aquariums in the world. It's still ranked as one of the top two or three aquariums yeah. in the world. I went to work for this company here, Aquatic Creations Group. In 2004, we purchased the business. Um, and Aquatic Creations Group has been around the area about 15 years. We're one of the longest running, quote unquote, uh, aquarium shops, aquarium businesses yeah. in the area. And the reason for that, because I, I'm speaking from experience here with him, is you guys uh, have a real eye for quality and uh, you want to make sure everything's right. Yeah, part of our, our company's goal is to do things the right way. And we strive to provide people with the exhibits they want. And our business model is, is we are a professional aquarium design, installation and maintenance company. So we'll help you design your aquarium that you want in your business or your home. Right. Uh, we'll install it, do all the plumbing, do all the setup, and then we'll provide you with the animals. We'll show you how to feed and do whatever, but really that's all you have to do. Wow. And then we'll come by, you know, once a week, once every two weeks, um, and maintain that exhibit for you. Our business consists of predominantly medical, dental, and professional businesses. So we make sure that livestock comes from a reputable dealer, wholesaler, and then we quarantine those fish, make sure that it's healthy, it's eating, disease-free before it's delivered to the client. So you're kind of like a fish hospital here that makes sure everything's disease-free before you send it out to major clients. In a way, yeah. We, we're known for being more of a maintenance company than an right. actual retail operation. But we have retail hours. Um, we're actually expanding that a little bit um, because we have, you know, kind of expanded our staff. And so we actually have a full-time store manager okay. at the moment. And, and we're also really involved in education with uh, a lot of the local schools and whatnot. We'll go in and do work with the schools, uh, do classes with them, invite their classes here. Uh, we'll do tours. Um, so we're kind of set up as That's an cool. education company, as you know, to do some outreach as well. That's amazing. So let's take a look here and see what you got as far as fish and. Yeah. Well, we've got the store divided up into about three different sections or so. Uh, we're standing in front of the freshwater section. This is the freshwater community fish. These are fish that most people have probably started out with when they were a child. And then uh, we have our saltwater section, which uh, you can see here is a, a variety of different size aquariums, but saltwater fish obviously are much more difficult to maintain than freshwater fish. Many of these fish are collected from the wild. So they're collected from the wild 
and they're transported thousands of miles. It's got to be stressful. It's very stressful. I get stressed just talking about it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so they get here and we try to de-stress them. We right. put them in tanks where they're not crowded. We feed them a good diet and we just let them chill out for about two weeks. At the end of two weeks, we assess, yeah, are they ready to go to a new environment? And when they go to a new environment, of course, it's like a, a, you're moving your family somewhere else. Your well, child sure. now has to go to a new school. Right. Has to make new friends. Right. That's a very stressful oh, time. Oh, it is. Well, the fish has to undergo that same stress. Wow. So in some cases, disease can erupt just because of stress due Pim to social issues. Pimples. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Acne. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, and sometimes we have to remove the fish from the aquarium just because it doesn't work out. Right. We have to relocate them. Right. And uh, then over here, we have more saltwater holding tanks. Uh, your typical clownfish, you know, Nemo. Everybody loves clownfish. You know, fish, it's, it's a universal thing now. Nemo, uh, Dory, the new Dory movies coming yeah. out. So we're already getting requests from clients like we do the Marvel's Museum tank. So they want, they, they're going to be showing the movie there. So they want sure. Pacific Blue Tangs or Dory as they're known. And then these are tomato clowns. They're paired up. The large one is the female. The small one's the male. And fish are kind of unique in that the male actually provides the parental care. If eggs are laid on the rock, for example, a clownfish will, will prepare an area on a rock, clear it out. The female will lay the eggs. But then the male will actually be responsible for watching those eggs keeping them free and clear of any debris or bacteria or whatever. Wow. And they fend off the nest. So the roles are kind of reversed in yeah. the fish world, you know? The most difficult, say, saltwater tank to maintain are reef aquariums, and these are different types of corals. Uh, so the hobby has come a tremendous way in the last 20 years because of the technology, because of what we've learned in maintaining animals. You can actually have an aquarium that if you were to put on a mask and a snorkel and stick your head in that tank, you, you would think, think you, you were, were there. You were snorkeling 5,000 wow. miles away in the South Pacific, which to me is still a phenomenal thing where you have a box of water in your home and you have all these incredible organisms. From across know, the country. From across the world. Yeah. Whatever, so let me, let me ask you something. So when, uh, like the divers, they say, be careful that you don't damage the coral. It's not the rock they're talking about. Is it? They're talking about these little animals right. and things. They're talking about <clears throat> if you kick in your fins. Right. It's very easy to break off the arms and the branches of a lot of these types of corals. Wow. They're called stony corals, and it takes years and years for them to grow sure. and to get to the size and build the reef that exists out there. So if somebody's interested in putting together a a tank, and they can even do it in their home. Yeah, we do homes uh, and, and commercial installations. They can call you? They, yeah, they contact us. And what we typically do is we, we schedule an appointment to meet with them. We want to see the location up front. Where do you want to put it? Well, right. You want them in an area that's somewhat dimly lit, that's going to be viewable. So when you're sitting down after a hard day at the office or working outside, you can come in and sit on the couch and view that aquarium and just chill out because it's a very relaxing yeah, it is. environment to look at. And psychiatrists and whatnot have documented it lowers your heart oh, rate. Oh yeah, blood pressure. Takes your mind off, your blood pressure. Yeah. So it's a very healthy thing to do. We call it living art. Yeah. And uh, people get very attached to their animals. That is so cool. So listen, now we've talked about the, the I don't want to say the average, but the normal aquarium stuff. But don't change your channel because we're going to come right back. We're going to show you some stuff that's going to really blow you away. I've been in an accident and I don't have insurance. I don't know what to do. I was in an accident and I don't have insurance. Now what am I going to do? Hi, this is Dr. Tim Weir and if you've been in an accident but you don't have health insurance, it's okay. We accept third-party liens. That means we'll wait for the insurance company to pay us. So if you've been in an accident, call us today. Raleigh Spine and Injury Chiropractic. Just when you thought nobody cared. Call 790-1332 right now. So we're here at Aquatic Creations with Gil. And Gil, we've got somebody here. Yes, Ooh. we do. We've got a very special person with us today. Uh, it's my wife, Michelle. Um, okay. And we are partners and owners of Aquatic Creations Group. 
we both met when we were in grad school. Michelle actually was one of my dive buddies when we were doing underwater fish research. And uh, shortly after meeting there, we ended up getting married and uh, we spent all that time in California. And so yeah. we're actually, since we moved here, we purchased this business. And, uh, you know, it's a, been a really kind of a fun ride, exciting. Um, yeah. We work together every day. Um, we also bring different strengths to the table. And, uh, and so her skill set and my comp skill set complement each other. Absolutely. And I think we, you know, we really provide a good service, a good product, and with a lot of knowledge and background um, about this particular industry uh, when people want to want to deal with us. So I, it's been a great, great relationship for us to own a business yeah. and do something we enjoy doing, actually. <laughs> so talk to me about where we're at right now. I mean. I'm you're, seeing this stuff behind us. That's in right. There. You're in our jellyfish lab, and this is where we culture three different species right now of jellyfish. So you're looking at the moon jelly, Aurelia aricia, and we have Aurelia labiata. And over here you're looking at Cassiopeia, which is the upside down jelly. So we have all life phases of this organism. So from the time they hatch until they grow up as adults and we sell them to clients. Are they actually little eggs that they... They are. In this particular species, the female has brood pouches, and she broods those eggs, and then when they hatch out as a little planula, they settle out into the substrate, and they become a polyp. And then in the polyp phase, the, that polyp phase elongates, they kind of butt off like a stack of dinner plates, and they form any fiery, which come back and grow into this medusa again. So it's a whole cycle from polyp to adult medusa, back to polyp again. And that's what we grow in the lab here. And we do the same with the Cassiopeia. Do people just buy these for their home and have a... Sure. Oh, yeah. They're, they're great fun. They're very relaxing to watch. They're in offices and commercial buildings, and people are finding that they're quite nice to have right there in their home. And instead of TV, wow. <laughs> they watch the jellyfish. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things people always ask, can you have other organisms in with the jellyfish? Unfortunately, you can't. With this particular species here, it's a specialized aquarium called a pseudochrysal. And it has to maintain a circular current to keep the jelly suspended in the water column. You can't put other organisms in there with them. With moon, this particular yeah. moon jellies species only here, live moon, with moon jellies. Moon right. Jellies. With the upside down jellyfish, um, this organism over here actually lives in shallow marine it's environments, the mangroves and whatnot. They're actually like a coral almost in that they have um, an algae in their symbiotic. Species zooxanthellae in their tissues and they require high intensity light in order to um, survive along with additional feeding. So those you can actually have a multi-species tank where you could have, for example, cleaner shrimp, other types of fishes. In there. In sure. With the jellyfish. Yeah. So that option's available with these particular animals, but not necessarily with... The and I guarantee most people would see that and not realize it's a jellyfish. Not they would all. think it would not be not something it's else. Uh -huh. Some alien looking yeah. from the moon, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> So you had mentioned before, they pull the food up through the tentacles? Is that well, how they do well, it? We could, we could actually feed some. You could oh, that would be cool. Yeah. Bill, yeah, would you want to get the, um, there's a, a beaker on top of the refrigerator with the turkey baster? I like to use a turkey baster because you can create just this nice and gentle plume of jellyfish food and um, get it evenly distributed in the tank. So I've got uh, a prepared jellyfish food that we make here, and it's got uh, noplii and rotifers and all kinds of nutritious things in here, eggs. And so you can see I'm just sort of dispersing this through the water column. You can also target feed jellies. If you're real gentle, you can kind of make sure that each organism is going to get a nice big meal, which is what I'm doing right now. That's called target wow. feeding. And so we let the current just disperse this food throughout the water column, just as though they were eating in nature or there's things floating around in the water they would be sweeping through. Now, is that live stuff there too? Yes, there is. There's and and you see there's this little, the tiny little tentacular fringe, it's this fine yeah. little tentacles. And they sweep through the water column and things attach to their tentacles. And then they have these long central oral arms. See the longer yeah. ones in the middle? And they kind of lick off their tentacles with those oral arms, and the food travels down a groove into their stomachs. Wow. So you can see the four leaf, four leaf clover looking. Yes. Oh, that's their stomach. Oh, wow. And you see the food that they've been eating in their stomachs. So eventually, and they're very efficient at sweeping food through the water column. So I'll feed a little bit, and I'll come back maybe a half an hour later. It'll all be completely gone. 
and some may need to eat a little more, so I'll, I'll squeeze a little bit more into sure. the tank. And, um, you know, a couple feedings a day if you can do it. It's really fun and it's easy to do. I haven't seen one that doesn't have food in it. Yeah, they're, they're very efficient sweeping yeah. food out of the water column, so that one's really full. Yeah. <laughs> He's been to Golden Corral. He certainly has. Are these, here, what, these jellies here are about two months old now? Yeah, almost. Two, two, almost two months. Right. And they're in the two inch diameter range right, right now. So. How long will they live? These organisms will live a year. So they live a year in nature uh, out, out, you know, that's their lifespan out in the wild. Sometimes uh, we can get them to live about uh, maybe 13, 14 months wow. in captivity. And because, you know, they're being fed every day yeah. and kind of pampered. So they'll, they'll live a little bit longer in, in captivity if they're being fed really well. So then part of your business then is to go in and make sure that the, the jellyfish, once they die off, you, you replace them. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. That's right. Yep. So in, and I've got all these questions, sorry. So in your home tank, would they start dropping what? eggs and all that kind of um, stuff? Well, they, you know what, they will. They, they will reproduce, but what will happen is you'll see these little polyps that settle out. These right. little larvae t turn into the polyp, and as you're cleaning the tank and keeping the glass nice and tidy, all of those get swept away. Uh, but very rarely will they live okay. in a clean system. Now, a right. system that's not being properly maintained, polyps will have a chance to adhere to the side wall, and you'll have some polyps growing all over the sure. glass. But then you won't be able to see anything in your exactly. tank. Exactly. For a, for a nice exhibit that you want to have as a display, you wouldn't have polyps right. growing in there. Okay. That's really more like a fouling organism at that point. Um, but yeah, they, they'll, uh, they'll start to age out and get a little bit slower as they get older and they're not pulsing as strongly. And before you know it, they're just, uh, they're aged out yeah. past their year, 13, 14 months, and then they're replaced with new younger jellyfish yeah. that they'll be able to enjoy for you know nine ten months yeah because by the time they're getting a jellyfish the jellyfish are two to three months old so they'll they'll, wow. have, they'll have them for nine ten months uh, is there research that's done on them sure yeah there's a lot of research being done with proteins that certain certain species of jellyfish produce yeah so uh, there are some um, labs that produce jellyfish just for research it isn't so much the eggs as it is the adult medusa that they're looking at. How exciting. Listen, if you're in the Raleigh area, is it okay if they just stop in during your regular hours and talk to you guys? Yeah, if they want to give us a call, a heads up to make sure that we, you know, we've got someone that can bring them to yeah. the lab, that'd be fine. And that would be Thursday through Saturday. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we're, we open at 11. Thank you for being new with me. You guys are Thank awesome. You. Thanks for coming. We have a present for you. Don't change the channel. Here we'll be go. right back. Look at that jellyfish. Look, and you know it wasn't funny, but thank no. you for laughing yeah. anyway. <laughs> I do appreciate yeah. it. Oh my God. They want to catch a profile. Who are you looking at, man? <laughs> That's for you. We sure appreciate you coming in to visit with us. <laughs> it's a block of styrofoam. It's a block of styrofoam. Take shot. No. no. Moon jelly, moon jelly. <laughs> <laughs>